We're live? Well, good evening. I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, the Beaumont City Council for Organizational Council Meeting for Tuesday, October 22nd, 2024, 6 p.m. here in Council Chambers. As we begin our meeting, all means we've been a landing acknowledgement, and I'll read that now. The City of Beaumont respects the histories, languages, and cultures of all First Peoples of this land, whether they be a First Nation, Métis, or Inuit descent, and appreciates that their presence continues to enrich vibrant communities across the land. As we gather here in Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation, we acknowledge that we are all treaty people and have ongoing responsibilities to protect and honor the treaty, the hand rights of the people, and the land. With that, I'll begin with an adoption of the agenda. Madam Clerk, any changes to the agenda this evening? Thank you, Mayor. Administration does not have any additions or deletions to the agenda this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Would you please put the motion on the screen for the adoption of the agenda? Member Council willing to move the agenda motion? Councilor Cook. I move that the October 22nd, 2024 Council agenda be adopted as presented. Thank you, Councillor. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none. Councillor Penrod? Sorry, I know, I know it's not something we usually uh, discuss, Mr. Mayor. I was just wondering, um, since Councillor Monkoff Swain is not here, can we still deal with items 5.1 and 5.2? My understanding was that we needed um, full attendance for that, those items. Just one second. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councillor Penrod is correct. We'll be jumping over those items. We'll be taking them off the consent agenda and we'll be referring them to a most likely special council meeting to deal with. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor. That's on my notes to get to the after uh, agenda, but that's fine. Okay. So we'll, do we uh, need to adopt the agenda, amend the agenda, Madam Clerk? So I can't see your microphone. Sorry, Mary, you can't turn my microphone on. Only I can. My apologies. Okay. Um, yes, I will um, do that. Just give me one moment. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Councilor Cook, would you care to remake the motion, please? Give me a second to get your microphone on. There you go. Thank you, Mayor. I move that the October 22nd, 2024 Council agenda be adopted as amended, removing items 5.1 and 5.2. Thank you, Councilor. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none. Would you please initiate the vote, please? And that carries unanimously, six nil in favor of the motion. Next on agenda is open forum. Madam Clerk, I believe there's open forum guests this evening. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, we have two open forum presentations this evening. The first open forum presentation will be the first poppy presentation to council here in Beaumont. Great. And then our second open forum is um, Aaron, uh, who is here in the audience as well, that will be making a presentation. Okay, thank you. Gentlemen, from the you join us at the, at the table here. Please state your name and, and uh, begin your presentation, please. Thank you, Mayor Danilak. My name is Steve Stamhuse, uh, Vice President of the Leduc Beaumont Legion Branch 108. Uh, with me this evening is Sean Cuppins, Branch Past President and Veteran of the Royal Canadian Artillery. It is our pleasure to present the first poppy of the 2024 poppy campaign to Mayor Daniluk and Council. 
The poppy represents a visual pledge to honor veterans and remember those who sacrificed for the freedoms we enjoy today. Funds donated during the poppy campaign are held in trust at the local level and dispersed directly to support veterans and their families and to programs to ensure we never forget. Thank you for your support. Thank you for presentation. Always a pleasure to have you gentlemen here this evening. It's been a year already since you were here last. I can't believe it's been a year already. So council, we'll go to the front and we'll, uh, we'll get a picture of everybody together and, and we'll continue on with our meeting in a moment here. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Our next presenter, Ms. McCormick. Yeah, please sit down when you're ready. And just please state your name for the record. And you have five minutes to present whenever you're ready to start. Welcome to Council. Thank you. My name is Erin McCormick. I am the co-chair for the Beaumont High School School Council and the vice president of the Beaumont High School Pres uh, Parent Advisory Association. I'm here to talk about the prioritization of funding a full-time school resource officer in our high school. We all know we are in desperate need of a new high school, which thankfully has been recognized as priority for the City of Beaumont by the Alberta government to hopefully break ground in the very near future. Our current building, when built in 1988, had the capacity of 250 students. Currently, we are sitting at 1,192 registered students, and although we built a small wing and four portables, the hallways between classes and dismissal are very compact. I brought my daughter and son and my husband, and we all went to the Oilers game for the very first time, the four of us, and we were going through, uh, trying to get to the bathroom during intermission. And I was very claustrophobic and feeling squished, where my daughter in front of me was doing this, and I just dancing a little bit. And I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, mom, this is great. It's not like the high school. I'm like, what do you mean? And she said, we are body to body to get through the hallways, touching. So that was in a very impactful moment for me, realizing how much we need this new school. This current September, we saw an increase of 100 students. With the growth of the city, the annexed land, the higher population, and the increase of students to our city, next year projections with current students in grade nine is going to be an increase of even more students entering grade 10 next year. The Beaumont High School is setting new setting new graduate record numbers each year, and for the foreseeable future, no class will be smaller than the one previous. Our current Constable Dilowski has been an asset, a great resource, and a wonderful person. We at the high school have nothing bad to say about her. However, Constable Dilowski is a reactionary resource and is only called and brought in for situational enforcement after the fact. We believe having a full-time school resource officer's presence will prepare us for the future growth of the school and be a preventative measure when dealing with potentially dangerous situations, drugs, alcohol, and vaping on school property, 
and building a relationship between officer and the student body. School Council is thinking about ways we can build that relationship so that the SRO and the students by bringing back the positive ticketing program to the high school ex exclusively. We are looking at local businesses to help but with donating rewards for the students who show integrity, hospitality, manners, positivity, et cetera. We implore you to take into consideration making a way in the budget to hire a full-time uh, full resource officer for our high school as soon as possible. We don't know the future, but hindsight is 2020. I'm sitting before you today asking for a resource the Beaumont High School requires in order to grow safely. Thank you. Thank you for presentation. I appreciate that. Members of the Council, any questions for our presenter uh, from this evening? Councilor Tellenbus, you have the floor. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Um, first off, thank <clears throat> you for the presentation. I know it's never easy um, presenting in front of anyone. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess a couple questions. Um, the first one being, um, you had mentioned some of the resources that are currently available, more, I guess, reactionary um, than proactive. Um, how, do you have any visibility to, uh, I guess, the numbers in terms of incidents or issues that have happened? Um, has there been an increase to the best of your knowledge? Um, are we becoming more reactionary than we were before? I, I just looking for a little visibility into some of the issues that might currently exist. Well, <clears throat> there's a couple of things. One, for instance, there is a particular bathroom that many of the students will not go to because there's vaping and drugs happening. And as much as the, the teachers can frequent that bathroom, it's not because of the cl classes and everything. Um, the other thing is, yeah, there is actually uh, two incidences this month already. And it would have been definitely a resource or a very um, beneficial to have someone uh, with authority at the school. So yeah, it's, and it's inevitable. There's just so many kids in such a tight space and we're only growing. So, and uh, the other thing is Black Gold has already approved SRO, um, SROs for high schools and junior highs and Leduc has them in all of their high schools and their junior highs. It's, uh, as I believe, or as I've been told, it's a council and it's a city funded position. And so that's why we have to come to you. Perfect, thank you. And I guess next question, obviously, uh, you, you alluded to uh, the good uh, news that we've recently shared in, in terms of a shovel-ready school site. Um, the hope is that the provincial government will, will fund that school and we'll get that on the go. Um, would the concept potentially be a shared resource officer amongst the two high schools or uh, would we be looking for individual officers for each high school? Well, let me ask you a question. How big do you think that Beaumont's going to grow population-wise in the next five to seven years? Hopefully we'll have a high school before then, but yes, yeah, absolutely. Well, actually, there. you know, five years, maybe four years <clears throat> before we get the high school. It has to be built, right? Yeah. But that's still, we are getting a lot of buildings built, houses built, business in, which is great. <coughs> we just need to know that our, it, it's such a family-oriented city that the children population is going to grow. And we have to be able to make sure that they're safe. And I see that, right, it, just like the ring road, we should have already started the other <coughs> ring road when that one was going because we didn't foresee even Edmonton getting that big, right? So that's kind of how it is. It's like, yes, let's get the next high school, but then let's start working on the next one after that. Perfect, thanks. Yeah, I second your comments. Uh, often I find some of these resource officers are undervalued, but um, the impact that they have on the students and the community are huge. So thank you again for your presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Cormick. See no further questions. I expect we'll probably have that discussion at budget uh, in November here, and we'll go from that point forward. Perfect. Thank you for your presentation. All right, next on our agenda is uh, consent agenda. Madam Clerk, would you put the consent agenda on the screen, please? Seeing none, is Member Council willing to move the consent agenda as presented on the screen? Councilman Newkirk. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I'd move the consent agenda as presented. Thank you. Appreciate that. So 6.1, 6.2. 
I'm just going down my list, make sure I don't miss anything here. Four, five, and six. Twelve, one. Perfect. Thank you, Councilor. Discussion on the motion, members of the Council? Seeing none, would you please initiate the vote? McCurry's unanimously, six nil in favor of the motion on consent agenda. Thank you, Council. All right, our first option, our first uh, order of business is on um, the Regional Library Board. Would you please join us at the table? And please state your name for the, for the file and uh, begin your presentation when you're ready. You have, I believe, 10 minutes to present. Oh, we get the timer today, too. Do I have to press the button? Oh, it's on already. Thank it's you. On already? Okay. Hello, everyone. YRL, and beside me, of course, is Carla Palachuk. She is our uh, d director at Yellowhead. And today, our presentation is a little bit of what we do behind the scenes for your library here in Beaumont. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of the director, Laura Winton, and the deputy director, Michelle Steinhausen, from the Beaumont Library. Um, we like to refer to Yellowhead as a library for libraries. We are the second oldest regional system in the province. Uh, we celebrated our 50th anniversary in uh, 2000 and it feels like a lifetime ago, but we were formed in 1971. Um, municipalities joined, choose to join a regional system or not, um, and that's often based on the recommendation from library boards, and that's because there's funds attached to it. So. Um, it's the council of the city of Beaumont that is our member. And then through that, we work with the library board. In Alberta, it is optional to be part of a regional system. In other provinces, it is mandatory. So we thank you very much for your um, consistent membership within Yellowhead that goes back almost to 1971. We exist to provide services and supports to our member libraries so that these libraries can do the best that they can for their, for their community and act as a community hub within the municipality. Some of the services that we will provide are the ones that are uh, very expensive and very time consuming and in some cases very boring to do um, so that the library staff can focus on working with community to build the social connections, to help support literacy, to connect people to health and wellness resources and to deal with any issues that might involve uh, so social isolation and support social connections. So we do have, we are required to have a three-year strategic plan. We're quite required to have this by the province. Um, the act and the regulations changed this year, so now we can do a five-year plan. And we're in the process of planning, of planning our new plan right now. Uh, we do have four main goals with this plan, along with targets and strategies um, to meet with that. And we thank you very much for your time so that we can update you on where we're at with these. Our, our goals are up on the screen, and we built these goals by um, a lot of consultation, which included uh, reading and considering every plan of service written by all of our members and all of our municipalities. So that's 54 member municipalities and 88 service points, 44 public libraries, 44 school libraries. So um, in order to be able to meet our targets and in order to support our members, we had to be able to understand what, what their goals are and they needed to be able to see themselves in our current plan. So we're in 20, these are 2023 results. We don't have our 2024 results that will be coming uh, fairly quickly here as time continues to move on. But our plan of service is aligned with our budget. Our budget does reflect our service priorities. A copy of our plan of service review, um, our plan of service and our annual report is uh, provided to council um, for your consideration and information. So some of our highlights from 2023, and this, um, all of this is still sort of ongoing work, is advocacy. We were successful in getting the biggest uh, increase of library provincial funding that I have seen in quite a while. Uh, it included an increase to the base rate, it included an increase to the per capita rate, and it included um, some additional services and supports. 
we at Yellowhead also went ahead and uh, revised all of our member library websites to update for code, um, for security features, and to make it a more user-friendly experience for everybody. And we also last year, and then again two weeks ago, uh, launched a in-person conference, which was the first one that was happened since pre-COVID. Our conference uh, this year ended up with 446 attendees, which was up from 107 last year. Some of our, our numbers, there's a couple here I would like to highlight, um, are deliveries. If anybody is wondering if print is dead, print is not dead. <laughs> we moved 1.9 million items in 2023 out of our building. We're on track to move over 2 million this year. I'll know those numbers next year. So that is 2 million physical items, DVDs, books, uh, books on tape, books on CD now, um, that come in and out of our building in Spruce Grove. The other thing that we did last year was we had 18 training events and we trained over 1,200 library staff. And again, that was mostly out of our space in Spruce Grove with some online component, but a lot of our training is done in person. For 2024, we are um, for the balance of 2024, we are addressing any remaining um, issues out of our current plan, and that also includes a huge focus on cybersecurity. So, making sure that our networks are protected, our library staff are trained, and um, the public is protected as much as we can guarantee that um, on the machines used for the computers in the library. Uh, to that end, we are taking over the management and the updating of the public access computers in the libraries. This is a change in service and one that um, hasn't been done since the early 2000s. So this is ongoing work and we're looking forward to having everybody on our network. Hank? Good. Uh, in your package, you also see one that actually says return on investment or basically uh, is also part of the package. I'd like to see talk to you about a little bit about that about the financial benefits you guys get with every dollar spent within your library or to us as well. And so, uh, yeah, you guys, uh, basically one dollar spent in the library for us is equals $14.15, which is quite something, especially for, uh, uh, we have a, a list here of just some of the things if you ever wanted to go out on your own and think you could get a better deal, that these would just be some of them that would do it. And so again, uh, your financial savings, according to what we, we have calculated, is close to $1.4 million. And so that's quite a substantial savings using us as well. Um, we are the only region that actually have five cities as well as smaller ones like Breton, which have basically less than 1,000. And so it's, it's quite of a balancing act, but again, it's, it's well worth the time. And uh, I believe from this document, you can see that your, your library is doing quite well. They are taking the training provided, and uh, again, that is helping them, and they are using the services that we provide as well, which is, uh, which is also nice to see, okay? Next is uh, the levies, I believe, okay? As you can tell, between 2008 and 19, we were always at $4.30 per capita. Uh, looking back during this time, I believe that was our biggest mistake, was not raising it every year, because uh, now uh, we are playing catch up. And uh, one of the overarching documents we have is what's called the Master Membership Agreement, which Beaumont has signed up on. And in that, it states that we cannot raise it more than, I believe, 2 or 3% per year. But uh, we have... Uh, we are doing that. We have basically since, uh, I believe it was since 2022. And so uh, each, each of those years, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, you'll see an increase. And again, for next year, it will be a 2% increase. There's, uh, if we need a bigger increase, we would have to open up the master membership agreement. And uh, having, uh, how many municipalities? We have over 54. 40, 54 and everyone on the same line and signing at the same time sounds like a very complex problem. Maybe we'd need Mike for that. <laughs> Anyways, okay. Uh, also, uh, with every dollar that you send into or so wherever you got, put it this way, 475, you get to us, a dollar comes, uh, 75 cents comes back to your library in, a, in an account that we hold for them, which they could uh, buy materials for us. 
part of the biggest thing that we offer is uh, uh, economies of scale. We represent about 318,000 people in our region, or thereabouts. And so we get to uh, go to places other than, how can I say, chapters are in to go and actually get a very good from the publishers themselves. And so basically I did this for Hinton a couple of years ago and found out that uh, they would be able to increase our buying power uh, up 70%, which is quite amazing. Mm -hmm. So again, we recommend that you guys continue to do that in the future. Okay, so your membership fees are levy for 2023 is 96,000 and change. Financial return is 17,000. Cost avoidance, as you can tell, is 1.3. Four million, which is amazing. Okay, uh, next slide. So through Yellowhead, you also have access to um, to the track system, which is over three million items. Uh, as of this afternoon, track is going to be supporting the cost of a new um, look and feel searching mechanism for the computers for public access for how track pack works. Um, it will work the same, it'll look better, and it will make it easier for you to identify the, um, the resources. Uh, the Track Society is paying for this resource. It will come out to be about $115,000 Canadian, and that is uh, fully funded by the Society at this point. Uh, we also support the cost of the broadband internet through Supernet for your library. Uh, we support the network equipment, the wireless um, endpoints, all of that equipment is considered to be yellowheads for the purposes of insurance and replacement. So as things age out, we replace it on behalf of your library. Um, the other thing is we are work currently working with the Beaumont Library to find a better, more streamlined way to get resources into your library. Uh, meaning that we are hoping to work with one of our vendors to deliver the materials ready to go on the shelf uh, straight from their, their, their repository rather than having to come to Yellowhead first, as Beaumont is now the highest uh, purchasing, highest volume purchaser that we have out of our 54 member libraries and 88 sites. So who, huge kudos to the board of the library and the staff for paying attention and working to ensure that the resources are appropriate for what the community needs are. And I think at that point, we are done. Great, thank you for your presentation, much appreciated. Always a pleasure having the Regional Library Board come for us and with the presentation. Uh, any question, question members of council for our present? Hang on a second, my screen is here. I have Councillor Penrod. Thank you, Mayor Daniluk. Thanks, Hank. and. Thanks, Carla, for being here with us tonight. Great presentation. Um, I love the way that you have laid out, laid out the uh, return on investment for the levies that we have. Could we have the slide? I think it's uh, the levy slide, 11 of 14. There we go. Um, just wanted to f ask a little bit more around this. How do the levies that YRL charges out to member libraries compare to other regional libraries in Alberta? We are less than half. Um, the other, Parkland, the region that's directly south of us is also the only other one that bills out their municipality. Um, we only charge the municipality, Parkland only charges the municipality. They are approaching $9 per capita. The other regions also get funding directly from their library boards. So um, municipality and library board, they're pushing 14 to $20 per capita anticipated for 2025. Thank you, so our, our dues to YRL are less than half if we're a member of any other regional library system. Um, that's phenomenal value, but I wonder, Hank spoke to this a little bit, um, how sustainable is that in the long run and are there any solutions barring opening up the, uh, the master membership agreement because we're not giving you my guess, sorry. I don't get Mike. <laughs> Well, I've heard that story before. He came here from Hinton years ago now, but uh, yeah. And so um, yeah, that's a, that's a process actually that our financial committee would, or ad hoc committee would like to discuss. Also a little bit further of, uh, uh, we have healthy reserves as of right now. And I believe you already know that. And so uh, to spend some of that down, plus the 2% increases we have should keep us viable for 
uh, quite a few years yet. So again, I don't think it's the time yet to open it up, but it's the time basically to say, well, if things go haywire, then yeah, then we will. So again, it always seems to be in the back of our mind. But again, we have a very good staff within Yellowhead at this point that is able to find money from, I don't know where you get that from sometimes, but uh, <laughs> but it is very good at, at, uh, at doing that. So they always, always when it comes to budgets, you aim high and then you, uh, and then you uh, finish out low. And so that's happened to us for the last few years for sure. May I add? Oh, please add. Um, we zero base budget every year. So in May, we zero out everything, including the staff costs. The managers are required to go through and tell me what they need, uh, not what they want, but what they need, so that we are not expending out um, or planning to do anything that a we can't, that isn't required under the mass, um, under the master membership agreement and or isn't required under our plan of service. So we spend a lot of time because we start budgeting in May and the budget work for us finishes in December. So we try to do what we can to anticipate, project, and plan ahead so that we can make the best decisions and keep the costs as low as possible. Thank you for your prudence. Um, if I could go back to slide, I think it's 5 of 14. Uh, yep, yeah, right there. So I noticed this logo in the bottom right-hand corner there. Um, I guess bottom left hand, my right, your left. <laughs> yeah. Um, just wondered, uh, I was interested to see that the YRL is an Alberta living wage employer, and I'm wondered since how long and how has that certification impacted your operations? I understand there's some expense involved, but what other impacts has it had on the operations? Sure, thank you. Um, it cost us about $100 to be a member oh. of the Alberta Living Wage Employer Group, so not that much. Um, what this allows us to do is compare um, our wages against what a family of four, but also a senior couple and a single person would require in order to be able to afford groceries and housing without any supplementary work. So no, not working three or four jobs. For us in Spruce Grove, that is works out to be $23 per capita, or per, per capita, $23 an hour. Wouldn't it be great if it was $23 per capita? <laughs> um, no, it's $23 an hour. And we actually didn't have to adjust our grid. So our salary grid met that requirement to be considered a living wage, which means even our part-time staff can work at Yellowhead without being too concerned about finding extra part-time work or supplemental. So our, our salary grid fits their criteria. They give us the results. They also, they vet our salary grid and our hourly rate against Spruce Grove. So it's not me saying that we are, it's them telling us that we are. They being the network? The network, which is why we can actually use that logo. If we were to drop below the living wage, we would be given six months to adjust that grid uh, before we would lose the right to use that designation. So it had very little impact on our wages at all, but we were the first regional system in Alberta to get that designation and one of the only libraries to pursue it. Beautiful, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor. Next we have uh, Councillor Barnhart. Thank you. thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, lots of good information there. Two things caught my attention. Many things did, but two things I will ask questions about. Mm -hmm. And it's about the uh, provincial advocacy that you've done. I'd like to know your secret. How did you get <laughs> an increase in provincial funding? Uh, there's other groups who are struggling with the same. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we were lucky. Um, we actually have uh, an executive, uh, case, uh, a lady that runs the front of, the fr front of our uh, place that is very tenacious. And so she actually uh, makes sure that we get uh, our time in front of uh, all our MLAs. And uh, as of last, last year, last election year, I think uh, out of all the regions, we saw them all, I believe, it, all of them. So you really work Okay, well. in our region, okay, mm -hmm. in the Yellowhead region. What, one other part of this, uh, it, 
you said it was increased by a significant amount. What is the amount that you're getting? What, like what percent of your budget? Is some, give me some idea of it. Sure. Um, we, Alberta Municipal Affairs Libraries Branch was providing funding based on 2020, uh, 2016 population. They increased that population up to 2019, 2020. So that was a huge increase for a lot of our communities. They increased the base rate grant for communities that could have seen a decrease in population from $5,000 to $9,000. So that was almost, that almost doubled. And that was huge for places that are, we're seeing a decline in population. Um, there was a five cent per capita increase, so it went from 450 to 455, so not much, but still better than what we had been getting. So from 450 to 455, and same thing on um, for the Regional Library System grant. So it wasn't, the population boost absolutely was the biggest that we saw. Um, on top of that, they are still continuing to subsidize the SuperNet costs as well as some e-resource content, which would save me, we still pay about $50,000 a year for SuperNet costs for the local libraries, and, but it would double that if they didn't have it. But it was a concerted effort provincially, including the city libraries, um, who all agreed on the same messaging and the same provincial ask. Mm -hmm. So uh, the regional systems, seven of us, developed that message. Edmonton, Calgary, St. Albert, and, Fort S and um, Strathcona County changed their messaging after ours came through in order to support ours. The only thing we did not get was a guarantee of inflationary increases every two years. So we're still poking at them for that one. But it was, it was uh, three years worth of work and it was done as a group that represented the entirety of the population of Alberta. So he certainly helped. And yeah. So in proportion to what uh, municipalities are paying, do you have a, a sense of like, is, is the province paying this, is it like 50-50? Do you rely on them or is it a small sliver of that pie? Just a, a sense of whether we're relying on municipalities to fund libraries more or less than the provincial government? That depends on the size of your municipality in some ways where the, who pays the bigger share. So for places that are quite small, um, the province pays about 75% of the operating costs with their municipality paying 25%. In places like Edmonton, Calgary, Red Deer, uh, the municipality pays about 80% with the province paying 7% and the rest coming in fees and fines and other revenue because it's all population. The Libraries Act though puts library service in as a municipal service, not a provincial one. And that's language that you will hear, mm -hmm. that we hear quite a bit when we go in front of them for funding. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that background. I really do appreciate the, the, the other, The last thing I wanted to ask you about was, did I hear you say you haven't had an in-person conference since COVID? Did I miss? That is correct. We had one last year oh. and we had one uh, two weeks ago. Okay. So last year, 107 people showed up. Uh, this year, 446. I think people are starving for that oh. mingling again and getting yeah. together in person. So, uh, And there was a strong contingent from Beaumont. It really helps in terms of advocacy, I think, as well, to see the, the large numbers. And it does. Invite the MLAs. Yeah. I'll stop there, but thank you very much for that. Thank, thank you, Councillor. Councillor McCook, you have the floor. Thank you. Really appreciate the presentation, and um, I know I've said it many times, but libraries truly are kind of the hidden gems of our cities, and they're really important parts of our communities, so appreciate that our library also has um, support there as well. Uh, many of my questions were already kind of asked around some of the living wage and um, the uh, provincial grant. Can you expand just a little bit on how you support our library on the technology side? Thank you, Councillor. Um, what have we done? Um, the core business application for circulation services, which is TrackPack or Track, is fully funded uh, by Yellowhead. So it is in our master membership agreement for us to provide that resource. So that means the licenses uh, to circulate the books, um, the maintenance of it, the staff to run it, the upgrades, all of that comes from Yellowhead or from our partners through Track. Um, we have... We provide the, we subsidize and pay for uh, supernet lines, internet service, and the websites. So we pay for the platforms. We also provide the staff uh, to update all of that if Beaumont 
has a reason that they can't get to it, but then we will. We provide um, all of the networking equipment for the staff back end. So hubs, routers, um, anything that requires power and has flashing lights on it that requires our staff to come down and fix if it doesn't work. So we do all of that stuff. Um, we also are now taking over the public computer maintenance. So we're adding something called deep freeze on there and a couple of other maintenance pieces so that when the public is done using the computer, it gets rebooted, all of that information is erased, it restores the, the screen back to factory reset. And that can be done very easily. And then it also permits us to push up all of the updates. So if there's a Microsoft update, we'll push it out from headquarters onto the computers so that we can be sure that everything is, is kept safe. We pay for... Um, internet cybersecurity training for the libraries and all of the staff. Um, what else do we do? We do a lot. Um, pages as well. Yeah, I talked about the web pages. We do a lot. Yeah, for and sure. And all of this mm -hmm. stuff is, again, because we have the negotiating power with the vendors, we can be get better, oh, Microsoft 365 licenses, mm -hmm. and we're just moving the libraries over to the most recent version of that. Perfect. So we pay for anything along those lines. Not because it's in our master membership agreement, but because it makes sense to do it because we can get the discounts and we have the in-house expertise. Yeah, perfect. Thank you for clarifying that. I think that just goes back to where you guys highlighted, you know, how much we get back for every dollar spent and everything. So there's definitely a lot on the technology side there. So appreciate you laying that out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. See no further questions. Thank you for the presentation. We much appreciate the information and uh, thank you and enjoy your evening. Thank you so much. Next we have uh, Ms. Winton from our Beaumont Library for a 10 minute presentation. And guest. And guest. <laughs> Just please state your names for the audio file and begin when you're ready please. We have 10 minutes. Awesome. So uh, I am Laura Winton. I'm the director of the Beaumont Library. And I have with me today Michelle Steinhusen, who is our deputy director of the library. So I'm not sure if everybody has met her, but here mm -hmm. she is live and in person. <laughs> uh, do we have our PowerPoint? Maybe? Possibly? It's coming. It's coming. Stop the clock. <laughs> there we go. So thank you so much for this opportunity to present to you guys again. Uh, we're very excited to provide you with updates on the library's work over the summer and what's coming for the rest of the fall. Do I control this or do you guys? Oh, I can. Oh, you got it. Fancy. All right. So before we dive into the work we're doing, I want to highlight our vision and our mission. Our vision answers the question, what do we want our library to offer the community a generation from now? Our mission tells us what we do now to achieve that future vision. Our values act as guiding principles that steer our decision making, learn and express themselves, and we achieve that vision by connecting people to ideas, experiences, and one another. All the while, while we do that, we are guided by our values of connection, courage, fun, inclusivity, and respect. So a lot has happened at the library since our last update to council in May. We're excited to tell you about the launch of our video game collection and Mayor Daniluk will be featured on some of those slides. <laughs> we'll also be reporting on our summer reading club and uh, we'll, we'll be letting you know what's coming up with programming and partnerships for the fall. And then finally, we're very excited to show you the almost completely finalized layout for the redesigned main library and update you on the timelines for the completion of that project. Okay, I don't know how good this mic is. Okay, in August, the library launched our new video game collection. The library asked City Council for funding to add this collection in 2024 based on high demand from our community and an extensive body of literature showing that gaming improves cognitive skills, critical thinking, and fine motor development. And also, frankly, video games are just plain fun, which is part of our values. Uh, with the support of City Council, we purchased 500 video games and we launched the collection for borrowing to the community on August 17th with our inaugural Mario Kart Grand Prix tournament. The program room was packed with over 50 players and supporters. Eight teams of four faced off to see who would take the Mario Kart crown and the winning team faced off against Mayor Daniluk. 
Uh, and I'm sorry to say, thoroughly trounced him. Um, Mayor, despite your lack of Mario Kart skills, we are very, very grateful for your participation, and we know the winning team was honored to leave you in their dust. Um, this yeah, was a very good. popular event. We're going to do it again next summer, um, so <coughs> if you need any training, uh, we can set that up for you. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, you can sign it out of prep. Uh, since the collection's launch, it's become our most borrowed collection. So 1,241 games were borrowed by the end of September. This collection flies off the shelf with an average of nearly half the collection checked out at any given time. So we're really thrilled to be able to offer this collection to the Beaumont community. Summer reading clubs play a crucial role in preventing summer slide by keeping kids reading and learning through July and August. Each year, the library hires two young people, these are uni usually university students, to lead our summer reading club. Uh, this year, we had Nam and Francis, who you can see from the pictures on the slide were just a blast. We, we loved having them around. Um, they led the charge with a suite of summer programming. Our popular Reading Buddies program was back. This program pairs older readers with younger readers for weekly reading and exploration at the library. This year, we engaged the high schools in recruitment for the Big Buddies, and we saw a huge increase in the numbers. So that was a great strategy, and we're very excited to partner more uh, with the high schools. In the middle picture, you see Nam and Francis are highlighting our Reading Buddies board, where little buddies added either a star or a spaceship for each day they read over the summer. So a lot of reading happens through that program. The Bibliobike was all over town, partnering with City Rec for summer in the park programs, doing pop-up visits around the city, and attending the farmer's market weekly. And finally, we launched our first adult summer reading game that challenged grown-ups to spin the wheel and read a book in the genre they landed on, and we're excited to expand that program in 2025, so stay tuned. Overall, we had 1,550 participants in our summer programming. Okay, so moving to the fall, uh, the library has a full slate of programs for the fall for all age groups and interests. We continue to prioritize partnerships to ensure we're making the best use of resources and collaborating rather than duplicating. We launched a new series of parent-focused programs with FCSS Beaumont, hosted at the library. FCSS Beaumont uh, leads the workshops on a diverse range of topics from social media to building social connections and to help reduce the barriers for these parent focused programs the library is running a stay in play program for children at the same time and this allows parents to attend without worrying about child care and we just had our first session and it went very well and the kids didn't want to leave so that's always a good thing too. Uh, we're also excited to collaborate with the Youth Center on their screening of Boys Will Be Themselves for Family Violence Prevention Month. The film takes viewers on a journey to a positive, more hopeful understanding of masculinity that is inclusive and grounded in empathy. After the screening, there'll be a Q&A with the filmmaker and the library is very excited to be part of this event. And I want to give a huge shout out to Brody Stenhouse at FCSS Beaumont for making this happen and for taking my suggestion. <laughs> uh, and we are bringing back our annual writers contest this fall. So the contest is open to writers aged 10 to 17. Young writers are invited to submit a piece between November 1st and November 30th. Submission will be judged by a panel of local celebrities and we'll celebrate the winners and participants in December. To support our young writers, we're hosting a writing workshop on November 4th with best-selling author Natasha Dean, and that will also include pizza, because you can't have a teen program without pizza. If you feed them, they will come. Yeah. <laughs> Last, but certainly not least, we have an update on our community gathering space project. This project is funded by the city of Beaumont, who generously contributed $210,000 in capital reserves, or capital funds rather, the library itself, who are using our capital reserve of $150,000, and a community facility enhancement grant from the government of Alberta for an additional $108,000. 
The major priorities for this project were to increase spaces to gather for community members, to use shelving to divide the space and create different zones, to make better use of the large open space in the middle of our current layout so it feels less cavernous. This is something we heard in community feedback a lot. To improve noise control and to add more collections, bringing us closer to the minimum standards for collection size for a community of Beaumont size. Since we confirmed full funding in the spring, we've worked with a design firm to develop the layout that you see on the screen, and we, we believe it's going to address most of these priorities. As you can see, the new layout fills the entire library space and uses shelving down the middle of the library to create two separate areas that we've then subdivided into smaller sort of subzones that we're really confident are going to feel inviting and cozy. Our children's area is getting significant enhancements, including a play shed that will be funded by a donation from the Mayor's Golf Tournament, activity tables and reading pods, and additional seating for parents. We'll be incorporating self-checkout systems to modernize our operations and increase patron privacy. And as you can see, there are lots of designated gathering nooks and comfy seating. We'll be going to RFP on this project in November, and we anticipate having all necessary components ordered by year end. Given the timelines for delivery on some of the products, we're, we're likely to see install uh, and be ready to unveil the new main library in March or April of 2025. The library will need to close for about a week to coordinate some minor construction and div uh, delivery and installation of all the components, and more information will be available on that closer to the date. So I look forward to providing Council with another update on this project early in the new year, and I promise to have lots more fun pictures of the cool stuff. I just gave you the layout this time, but it'll be more exciting next time, I promise. Um, before I close, I would not be doing my job as the library director if I didn't note that this layout will allow us to do more with our limited space, but it will not solve all our space issues. Our library will remain less than half the size it should be to serve the current population, and we see that every day with overflowing programs, community space requests that we can't fill, uh, and the amount of material that we're bringing in from other libraries because we just can't accommodate what we need on our shelves. Uh, the redesigned library will help us with some of this, but it can't solve it. And we're also aware that the space is going to feel quite full once we have all this new furniture in there. So this is a stopgap, uh, but we <coughs> desperately do need more space. Um, we have been closely following the city's 2024 A Place to Grow Community Engagement work, and we're so excited to work with the city as you explore how to make those citizen-confirmed facility priorities a reality. Uh, so on behalf of Laura and myself, I want to thank you again, Council, for your support of the library, and thank you to City Administration for being incredible partners. We look forward to seeing you again during budget workshops and in the new year for another, <coughs> another update on our work. Update part of our presentation. So, and yes, the uh, Mario Kart event, I was humbled to put it politely by the, <laughs> the winning team. So. I'm going to practice more for next year, but it was, uh, it was a fun event. It was great for the library and great kickoff for the new uh, video library inventory. So with that, open up the questions, members of council, for our presenters. Councillor Penrod, you have the floor first. Thank you, Mayor Daniluk. Um, <clears throat> appreciate the presentation, Ms. Winton and Ms. Steinhausen. Did I get that right? Steinhausen. Thank you. Uh, you. You just closed with this, but um, I want to poke at it a little bit. Uh, is there an industry standard for how much space a city of 23,000 people-ish should have for their library? What kind of, what's the source for that? What does that look that like? Gave? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the question, Councillor Penrod. Um, yes, the Public Library Services Branch, which is a part of the, the Municipal Affairs Department for the provincial government, uh, maintains best practices for public libraries in Alberta. That document outlines everything from collection size to staffing to IT needs uh, to building size. Um, the building size one is quite complex and it requires you to input all sorts of data. Um, the Beaumont Library has done that and we keep it updated. And as of right now, um, we should be over 20,000 square feet for the size of the population that we have and we're currently 8,000 square feet. Thank you. Uh, and. You did also mention this, but just maybe an opportunity to say a bit more, um, and I'm always interested in specific details. Uh, what are the most significant impediments to library services due to this limited space in the current building? Um, you mentioned having to turn away or, or just not having space to accommodate rental groups or... Um, 
Well, I'll, I'll respond first and then I'll see if Michelle has anything to add. Um, program space is absolutely at a premium. So um, whenever we have any sort of special event and we, we run special workshops at least once a month, um, we are, we are um, sort of uh, challenging fire codes sometimes because we just have so many people wanting to attend those. Um, so we are at the point where we're gonna have to start turning people away for those. Um, the limited space also just limits the amount of programming that we can offer and the types of programs that we can offer because of that limited space. Um, I have mentioned the collection size many times. We should have a collection size of at least 42,000 items in our current library. We don't have space for that. We, we've closed in on 30,000 this year and with the expansion we're hoping to hit 36 or 37, but we can't possibly hit that 42,000 items and we see that in the amount of material that we're bringing in. Uh, we also regularly have requests to host community groups for events and programs, um, to use spaces in the library. We are so full with our own programming right now that we just can't accommodate really any of those requests anymore. Um, so limited in lots of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would add just yourself? add um, something that's coming up more and more is the lack of study space mm -hmm. in the library. And um, there's not a lot we'll be able to do with the redesign for that. But um, there are certain times a year, you know, when it's exam time at the universities, exam time at the high schools, because every table is packed. And we try as much as possible if the program room is available to set some tables up in there and some chairs to give extra space. But again, we're competing with our own programs. So that's something that we've heard from the public is they, they really need that extra study space as well, so. Thank you, Councilor. Any quick questions for the Councilor? Oh, Councilor Ventano, anything? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a quick question again. Thank you for the presentation. Just wondering, uh, just curious more than anything, if uh, the clientele has changed lately with uh, with your team investing in in the gaming and and what have you. Like, have you noticed a shift in in your general attendees uh, versus now? I guess with with what you've introduced. Maybe I'll pass that to Michelle. You're, you're closer connected to programming on the ground than I am. <laughs> um, I think with bringing in collections like the video game collection, we're actually serving the growing population, the growing young population of Beaumont. So we're seeing uh, the same, we're seeing families, we're just seeing a lot more of them coming in because we're, we're able to provide, uh, provide that service. So, um, I would say we're also seeing a real increase in newcomers coming to our programs. We, don't, we run a weekly ESL conversation club and that the attendance to that has also been increasing quite a bit. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. See you for the questions from members of council. Thank you for the presentation and we'll see you at budget time. Right. Not that far away actually. So. I know. <laughs> thank you again for this evening. All right, with that, our next item on our agenda, <clears throat> pardon me, is uh, item 8.2, Protective Services Long-Term Planning. Director Melvin, I believe you'll be presenting this evening. You want to join us at the table if you, if you prefer? Yep, yeah, that's fine. And please begin when you're ready. Uh, well, good evening, uh, Mayor and members of Council. Uh, presenting the Protective Services Long-Term Planning um, for our area. Uh, before I start, I do want to point out the uh, efforts and um, uh, support from uh, uh, Cassandra Squires, our uh, manager of strategic initiatives, uh, who worked with me in uh, trying to pull all this information together in a, uh, in a um, way that can be easily presented. Next. <laughs> um, so to start, uh, administration has developed this long-term plan uh, for protective services based on the information presented in our um, level of service uh, review completed by TSI earlier in the spring. And um, uh, further to that, the level of service policies that were approved for fire service and municipal uh, enforcement. Now the information in this report it's provided awareness on the long-term needs for protective services 
And we uh, continue to see record growth in the uh, community and therefore obviously a strain on uh, protective services and the service lines within. Now obviously historically uh, Beaumont and the rapid growth that we've experienced had a, has had an impact um, on all of these service lines within the municipality. Uh, the level of service review that we did earlier this year was just the first step, um, which confirmed the level of service that would be appropriate for Beaumont and in each area of protective services. Uh, now obviously with that, uh, administration has been able to identify the city's anticipated needs uh, for 20, uh, up to 2043, improving the ability to financially plan for these items. Now the financial estimates offered in this report provide an idea of what these costs are at today's rates based on publicly available information and what other uh, jurisdictions have uh, paid for similar needs. The operating costs of facilities have not yet been calculated. Uh, the numbers in the tables that we're going to see here shortly um, are not a complete estimate and will be uh, refined uh, through subsequent budget processes and uh, within our uh, comprehensive growth plan. Uh, so obviously this report is going to be based on areas of protective services and like I said, it's not uh, all dates uh, line up. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the first thing is we talk about uh, protective services. Uh, administration is uh, projecting uh, the, le the need for a multi-service facility in 2034 and uh, obviously will require funding for land acquisition and uh, design for the facility. Uh, the multi-service facility would accommodate fire service, municipal enforcement and RCMP. Uh, the level of service report that we uh, uh, seen in the spring suggested that the RCMP would outgrow their facility by 2028. And in addition, uh, the report did discuss municipal enforcement's uh, municipal enforcement office space and the requirement for additional space. Now, obviously, uh, this does not line up uh, with the uh, 2032 uh, 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 for the multi-services facility, um, but we uh, believe that a temporary solutions could be there to uh, mend the gap before the facility comes online and ensure that we don't. Um, uh, incur uh, costs that wouldn't be effective for the community. Uh, staffing levels required for the multi-service facility is covered in the individual sections below as we get down through it. Um, and as we uh, look at the table itself, uh, 2032 obviously design funding and land acquisition uh, for the multi-service building. And then uh, as stated earlier, this is to accommodate all three uh, service lines within protective services. Construction of the uh, 2034 multi-service building uh, facility and required equipment, um, like we said, that the RCMP were likely to grow their facility um, within the next four years. Um, and fire service will need an additional fire hall location to meet the needs of the growing population. Uh, currently, municipal enforcement has already grown uh, their office space that they're currently in at Ken Nickel. Uh, the current fire hall in Saunterville would be decommissioned uh, once the multi-service facility came online. Now, as we go down further, we dive into uh, fire services. Uh, so prior to the multi-service stations, uh, fire service requires significant investments uh, to be made to meet the level of service council uh, has confirmed. Um, council will receive a request in the 2025 budget deliberations for two additional FTE firefighters to replace myself and the deputy chief from being uh, first out to responding to calls for service. And administration recommends moving to seven day a week coverage at the current fire hall in uh, Saunterville uh, in 2027. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in order, obviously, um, concern is around 24-7 uh, coverage and what that means for the fire service. Um, administration is recommending planning for a second fire hall being constructed in 2030. Uh, requiring design funding and land acquisition in 2028 and additional uh, eight FTE firefighters to be hired once the building is complete. Uh, lastly, depending on our growth of the community, an additional fire hall is expected to be required by 2040. And as we go through the table, you can see each uh, year on what the budget allocations uh, estimates are. Uh, and obviously, as the years uh, for that budget uh, go through the process, these numbers will be updated to current prices. The, um, 
Next slide, please. Uh, municipal enforcement, uh, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Uh, municipal enforcement team, the level of service review uh, recommend additional CPOs as population growth increases to maintain police to population ratio. Uh, ratio. And then the following table uh, represents those uh, staffing increases. Um, so in 2026, an additional CPO uh, along with uh, uh, the equipment provided that would be needed. And then, uh, as you can see, in 2030 and 2034, we start to get some admin support. And uh, further in the future years, almost every three years, you would see a new uh, CPO coming on board. And obviously, the one-time capital would be the uh, uh, equipment required for them to do their jobs. Next slide, please. RCMP. Um, so Beaumont is not anticipating to see any additional RCMP officers added until 2028, at which point it begins to grow with the population. Um, however, um, we are concerned with the ongoing increases to the operating contract with the RCMP, and the cost of officers continues to increase substantially. Um, as the years identified in this plan uh, progress and population and growth projections are updated, uh, the timelines are likely to change based on the needs of the community. In the appropriate years, as I stated before, administration will bring recommendations to council through the budget process. And additionally, care will be taken in the long-term uh, planning efforts to ensure the financial, or sorry, the financing of these projects is possible. Uh, financial analysis. So obviously some of these numbers can become alarming. Uh, items identified in the long-term planning efforts uh, from protective services will be included in the comprehensive both plan to help with multi-year budgets and ensure funds are allocated uh, to reserves each year. We also are looking at monitoring uh, grant opportunities and uh, obviously the um, ongoing update to our offsite levies. Um, so we're hoping that it is anticipated that a portion of these costs may be covered by developers. Uh, finally, administration is keeping in contact with neighboring municipalities and service providers, um, Leduc County, Edmonton, and the RCMP for any collaboration opportunities or joint funding um, of facilities. Uh, items, once again, will be brought forward at the uh, part of the budget deliberations uh, for the appropriate years. There is significant risk identified in this long-term plan to grow the city's protective services uh, and meets the needs of the community. It is anticipated that these recommendations will draw um, attention from the community. Um, obviously, the risk of not keeping pace of the growth that we're seeing uh, and their requirements uh, for protective services uh, have been identified in the Protective Services Level of Service Review Report, which identified 57 recommendations that uh, we, should, uh, um, we should continue to, uh, to implement. Um, we did not do any public engagements uh, or communication with residents, um, and uh, this concludes the uh, presentation. I understand there's lots of information um, in this report, and I'm open to taking any questions from uh, council. Um, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Director Melvin. <clears throat> I appreciate the report, and I thank you for presenting it to us this evening. At this point, open the questions. Thank you, Mayor Daniluk. Really appreciate the report, Chief Melman. Uh, it reminds me a bit of being in university and going to that first week of classes and getting all the syllabus, and then you sit down and you realize the amount of work that you have ahead of you in the next little bit. So it, as far as making the argument for the need of the comprehensive growth plan, congratulations, loud and clear. Uh, look forward to seeing that document as it comes through. It's a little bit of sticker shock looking at about $85 million of capital uh, needs over 18 years and about $4.5 million worth of operational costs. Um, but we know when we talk to our residents, number one concern is how do we keep each other safe, right? And, and that's what I see this report is people doing a lot of hard work to make sure that we can keep each other safe over the next couple decades as we grow. So thank you for your work on that front. I did, uh, tell me if I'm getting too far in the weeds on here, but uh, I noticed with um, interest that as we're building fire halls, we're also de planning to decommission the current fire hall, and that's not immediate. It's like 
about 10 years out, if I recall. Um, but I just wondered, is that building coming to end of kind of usable life or why are we building and decommissioning at the same time? Uh, through the mayor to Councillor uh, uh, Penrod, uh, the current building that we're in um, cannot handle 24 hour um, uh, facility. We don't have uh, the room to uh, renovate to put accommodations in. Uh, based on where it is, it's served the community very well, um, but it kind of restricts some of our um, response time, especially if we have to go through uh, south of the city, going through uh, Saunderville with the uh, two lanes uh, can create some, uh, some problems. So when we did look at what the growth of the city will be and strategically looked at response times, what's the quickest areas to get to uh, certain, um, certain parts of the city, uh, we looked at travel time and we looked at distance and we looked at where the community is going to expand to. Uh, we tried to um, look at it from a high level knowing that the uh, Saunterville uh, Fire Hall, um, when a new facility comes online, uh, will only be able to handle daytime coverage uh, and won't be able to do the 24-7 with the, uh, with the anticipated that a new fire station would easily be uh, built to that, to that spec and have the, you know, what, 25 to 50 year lifespan um, uh, with that. So that's the reasoning behind the decommissioning of one uh, when, a, when a new one comes online. Thank you, Councillor. Appreciate that. Councilman Newkirk, followed by Councillor McCook. Steve, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> and lots of numbers and uh, lots of values in there. Uh, there was one piece for me, though, that floats to the top in there that makes me wonder if we shouldn't figure out a way to be creative in action sooner, and that would be with the anticipated 2026 spend on a uh, single axle tanker and replace from an engine too. Um, we should probably, we probably owe it to ourselves to do a, a cost analysis on how much it costs to borrow extra money now versus how much those things are gonna cost in a year, year and a half. So we had quite a lesson with the ladder truck. Like, you know, we ordered that thing and then it was cost so much more if we wouldn't have ordered it when we did. So, you know, just, just a comment for thought there. And I know this budget's gonna be tight and I know the capital asks are gonna be a lot. But, you know, we probably owe it to ourselves to do some financial analysis on figuring out a way to make that happen this year versus waiting a year and what could those things be worth in the future. So just a comment. Yeah, so thank you. I can further comment on, on the reasoning behind that if you'd like. Sure, yeah. Okay, through the mayor to uh, Councillor Van Newkirk. It's in 2026 because it takes two years to actually get the apparatus. And what we're doing uh, with replacing a pumper with a uh, tanker is we're trying to combine two apparatuses into one to get their best value. Uh, it is in a 2025 budget. Uh, if that gets approved uh, through the budget process, it'll be um, um, spec'd out and ordered in 2025, okay. but we won't see it until the summer or fall of 2026. Perfect, right on. So that's, on. that's um, mm. and that's how we're doing all of those processes. We're hoping over time that uh, the timeline shortens, but right now we know that a typical uh, fire apparatus is anywhere between 18 months and 24 months, and an aerial apparatus is 48 months and beyond. Uh, so that's obviously very difficult to budget and difficult for the vendor to provide costing uh, as costs continue to, uh, to rise in emergency services because unfortunately none of our equipment is, uh, is cheap, very specialized, and uh, does serve a purpose. But for our next replacement, we are combining two needs into one, so we're going to gain value on that aspect and, uh, and be able to uh, continue providing excellent level of service to the community with the resources that we have. Awesome. Love to hear it. Thank you. Good. Great question. Great answer. Thank you. Councilman Cook, followed by Councilor in the town of us. Kat? Thank you, you Mayor. Um, I have a few questions, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> This is obviously um, a very integral report and it really lays out our future planning um, as it pertains to protective services. Um, and this is the important next step. And you know, we consistently hear from the, the public that we need to plan out ahead of time and this is exactly uh, what we're doing. Um, so I just have a few questions. The, 
multi-service facility is planned for completion in 2034. Um, kind of what steps are we taking to ensure that the timing of this facility aligns with population growth and could the timeline or would the timeline have to be moved up um, if growth exceeds expectations? Uh, through the mayor to uh, Councillor McCook, obviously uh, we're looking at it through today's lens uh, of what our, we think our, our growth plan will be. Uh, hopefully our comprehensive uh, growth plan will uh, be able to um, accurately mm -hmm. predict the future of where we think it's going to go. Um, but like I said, like anything uh, within emergency services, things could slide to the left and things could slide to the right depending on what's happening in the community and the needs and the risk uh, that we may need to anticipate something a little mm -hmm. earlier or uh, for some reason if we found a whole bunch of money that we wanted to invest, um, those, uh, those discussions would be had at a, at a budget, uh, budget cycle. Well, we're, within my team, we're constantly watching, we're really um, I'm focusing on the analytics, the data that we're seeing mm -hmm. on call volume, what the impact is to our staff members, uh, and ensuring that not only we're providing a safe and active service to the community, we're also looking after our employees doing so, and we're not mm -hmm. kind of doing more than, than what you would anticipate or expected uh, for staff members to do so. Perfect, thank you. And I think just that, that data piece is really important to be able to kind of track that and as you said, uh, either go left or right depending on what happens in the future. Um, so given the projection of the RCMP will outgrow their facility in 2028, you spoke to it a little bit um, that we're looking at some kind of temporary or um, solutions that are being considered. Um, what are our plans for, for them in between, you know, 2028 to 2030, 20, to when a possible multi-facility gets built? Uh, through the mayor to Councillor McCook, um, the today's lens look uh, would be something that we would have uh, temporary office space either located at the, uh, uh, at the RCMP that would kind of be um, within, uh, within the security parameters for the RCMP. Um, and most likely, um, if we were doing temporary to kind of um, look after RCMP and municipal enforcement. We would probably co-locate co them uh, in that area because they obviously would be growing in the space that they're in within Ken Nickel. Uh, so that is the, uh, that is the, uh, the plan for, uh, uh, for them. Uh, we do have a good working relationship with the RCMP. Um, we are we're looking at creative ways, whether that's shift modeling uh, to, um, to kind of lessen the, um, the administrative footprint that, uh, that they would need in the short term to um, benefit us long term so that we're not investing a whole bunch of money for four years and then then what do we do with it uh, yeah. so that's uh, that's a piece so as we get further down that uh, that road and those dates get closer uh, obviously we'll be working with our infrastructure folks to find out uh, their thoughts on uh, on infrastructure needs and how that's kind of working and mm -hmm. what we're seeing in other municipalities how we can um, get our, our our best value um, and uh, ultimately lessen the burden on the taxpayer. Okay, perfect, thank you. And then um, what progress, and I'm, I'm not sure if we can speak to this at this time, but um, has been made in our discussions with our neighboring municipalities uh, regarding potential collaborations? Uh, through the mayor to Councillor McCook, um, my relationship with Leduc County is, I would consider very good. Um, we constantly are having discussions on how we can uh, meet both of our needs. Obviously, there is a there is a a um, request or uh, or an idea that uh, can Beaumont uh, respond to the east, uh, where we have uh, uh, Leduc County residents, and uh, at the same time as we continue to push west to um, to uh, the vistas, what that looks for uh, Leduc County. Um, we are not opposed to any type of joint facility that. Um, both municipalities can share, whether it's be on our west border um, or having those discussions. Um, but at the end of the day, um, when it comes to future planning of protective services, uh, everything's on the board um, to have an idea and further explore it. And uh, ultimately, the ultimate goal is to, if there's a way we can reduce that burden on the ratepayer, then then we, why shouldn't we not explore it? So mm -hmm. uh, collaboration works well with Leduc County, no issues. Great, perfect, thank you. I'm, I'm 
look forward to seeing how those progress and, and where we end up with that. And I think that kind of leads into some of the grant opportunities as well. And hopefully we can really align some of those timelines with whatever grants come up and with some of the big asks that we have in front of us. So thank you. Thank you for, for all the work around this. And thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Next, I have Councillor Natalibus. Nathan, you have the floor. Perfect. Uh, again, thank you for the report. Uh, really appreciate it. Just a quick question in terms of, um, I guess, RCMP side of things. I see uh, more consideration, I guess, here right now in terms of capital investment as opposed to officers themselves. Um, would that come up in a separate conversation as opposed to this report, or does it fall? Uh, through the mayor to Councillor and to tell him, boss, are you uh, talking about addition of uh, more officers, uh, what that trigger point will be? Correct, yeah, and the funding side of things, because I just don't see mention of it. Uh, so annually, uh, we get the multi-year financial plan uh, that is reviewed um, within, the, uh, within Protective Services, a lot of collaboration with the RCMP to, uh, to get those numbers and based on what they're, what they're seeing. Uh, once again, everything is, is that risk analysis of um, a municipality our size, what we're seeing for concerns in the community, and like anything within protective services, things could either get pushed up or pushed to the right based on uh, whatever that risk would be. In the event that we come back and say that we're going to need officers sooner, we would bring that forward in the budget process to say this is the reason why, um, this is what the cost is, this is what the benefit is, and this is why we're um, we're accelerating uh, the staffing levels within the RCMP for this reason, uh, and that's how we would do it in collaboration with them. And uh, we would bring that forward to council, and council would make the decision based on um, input from administration and the RCMP locally. Perfect, thank you. Um, this question may be slightly out of scope, but um, just in terms of our actual assigned RCMP officers, my understanding is we have 17 assigned, but there's only 13 that are operational. Are you able to speak to, uh, I guess, um, the budget in terms of how uh, it is affected when we don't have four officers um, that should be here working? And then if there's any plan to, to, to figure out a solution to the four missing officers? Uh, through the mayor to um, Councillor Natalan Boss, um, I can comment on um, how it works when um, an FTE or, or an officer is, is not on duty. Uh, we cover the wages up until the 30 days. After the 30 days, uh, the RCMP looks after through their insurance uh, while their member is off. We do, uh, based on the risk of the um, of the detachment and the, the areas within the community. Uh, we have reached out and received officers seconded in from uh, Strathcona County, uh, Camrose, um, in areas where the discussion between the municipality, the local RCMP detachment, the district NCO, obviously the, the head uh, detachment in Leduc, to have that collaboration of, okay, we're down, we have four officers off sick or, or whatever happened, what's the plan to ensure that we still meet the service needs. Um, with officers going off uh, sick, one of the things that is obviously the reciprocal of that is increase in overtime. So we're trying to manage everything. So this is when we try to uh, bring an officer in from another detachment that maybe um, um, has officers available uh, to obviously lessen our load on overtime but also still meet the service needs and the needs of the community based on the RCMP's risk analysis. Um, perfect. Um, so I, I just, and again, potentially out of scope, but uh, I just find it somewhat concerning that we're missing a good percentage of our officers, um, either to illness, sickness, and, and obviously uh, we want to make sure the members are taken care of, but um, at what point do we say uh, we're not getting the service we need? Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Lantel and Boss, uh, the local RCMP uh, staff sergeant um, uh, collaborates with administration uh, weekly, uh, sometimes daily, uh, depending on what's happening in the, within the detachment and what the staffing levels are. I meet with them uh, every two weeks and get an update on staffing levels, what that's going to look like, uh, is it going to have any direct impact, are these short-term 
uh, people that are off, hey, they're going to be off for six weeks. Okay, can we still manage? Yeah, we're going to see a little bit in, in increase in overtime, but our, our, our service level is still being met uh, for that. If we've seen an extensive piece uh, where we had last year and the year before, we had significant members that were, uh, that were off or away from, uh, away from work, we did put the concern into the, um, into the local um, uh, detachment and then through our Danco and, and RCMP and Leduc uh, to trigger some uh, folks being seconded in because our concern obviously internally is we didn't want to burden our current staff with, hey, now everybody's got to work you know, one and a half times their capability and our, and our overtime goes up and we burn out staff so then in turn, we, more people go off sick. We're not really fixing anything. Um, so we're constantly doing that. Now, obviously, we know there's a worldwide or Canada-wide shortage of RCMP. They're starting to pick things up uh, within, the, within the depot uh, for training and, and getting officers out, on the, uh, out to fill some of the positions. But based on our current risk within the community, um, we're not anticipating to see any type of increases uh, within the next four years for, the, um, for that. We are hoping that um, our members, uh, if they are off long-term sick, can be replaced or we can get a temporary assignment in to uh, ultimately look after our staff and, and the needs of the community. So it's an ongoing collaboration. It's a constant um, uh, moving target, per se, um, but it's something that we focus on and I focus on every week to see what all our levels are, how we're doing, and uh, what needs we're meeting for the community. And if there's an issue, um, then we try to address it locally and, and see if we can solve the problem. Perfect, just uh, one last question, if you don't mind, Mayor. Different topic? Yep. Okay. Um, so just looking through this list, running through this list, looking <clears throat> at the timeline, um, I mean, obviously all of these are priorities, but it appears first in line um, would be fire services. Would you say that's our biggest efficiency currently in terms of protective services? Uh, through the mayor, uh, through uh, Councilman Helen Boss, um, what do you mean by deficiency? Just in terms of lack of resources, it seems like this is the first department we wanna address. Uh, okay, through the mayor to Councilman Tellenboss. Um, since I've been here over the last three years, um, I'm happy to say that we have a very passionate um, volunteer uh, membership um, that, uh, that the fire service has. Uh, it's something that uh, we're very proud of for sure. But um, moving forward, um, there is no way that um, as a community goes, as the call volumes go up, uh, it becomes really challenging uh, for me and my deputy to do all the stuff that we're supposed to do and still respond on calls, uh, however many they may be uh, daily or weekly as the call volume goes up. So uh, that is the initial, um, the initial ask, is to alleviate some of that so we can focus on the things that we're supposed to be focusing on and not trying to uh, double hat, uh, triple hat, um, the, uh, the piece for it. Um, so there's some discussions around, uh, around that. Ideally, um, I would like to see um, all the service lines um, have things in the budget every, every cycle, but I know that's not practical, uh, nor is it achievable. Uh, the fire service, uh, that was one of the uh, first immediate um, recommendations from the TSI report was to get your council policy level of service uh, completed and get your chief officers off from responding uh, first out the door. Uh, so that's what, uh, what we did based on our, um, our service. And uh, those were the two, uh, the two ask, obviously plus capital equipment um, as we continue to move forward. So uh, from a risk perspective, um, our risks increase every day based on how many people continue to move in or every home that's built, the risk continues to go up. But uh, it's not a risk that we cannot manage. Um, and I'm constantly looking at call volumes and what's being built and how we can get in there and, and having discussions early in the building process um, to ensure that um, we lessen uh, the risk and, and try to um, continue to move forward. The likelihood of, of a volunteer service continuing um, 
beyond the next 15 to 20 years for many municipalities. It's going to be very challenging, but it's also going to be very challenging to bring in full-time service because that's not practical either for some municipalities. So we need to find a balance uh, uh, between what's going to work for us, uh, whether that's a hybrid of mix of uh, paid on-call staff and, uh, and full-time staff. So as I said earlier, every option's on the table. Uh, we're looking at everything. We don't, I don't mind thinking outside the box, nor do I don't mind being first at something either uh, to give it a try. Um, so uh, as we continue through that budget cycle process, we will, um, we will bring those recommendations forward to Council. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate the thorough response. Yep. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Director Melvin. Seeing if no further questions from members of Council. Uh, my questions were essentially asked by another member of Council, more or less, and I'm satisfied with the answers you gave, obviously. Thank you very much. With that, I'll ask for a motion to be on the screen to accept the report as information, which I'll make myself to move things along. Um, when it's on there, I move that the October 22nd, 2024 report for information. Discussion members of Council. Seeing none, would you please initiate the vote, please? And that carries unanimously, six nil in favor of the motion. Thank you, Director Melvin. Services from okay, we're live back after our short break. We'll begin our continuation of our um, council meeting with item 8.3, Extended Transit Services, Millwoods Town Center, Edmonton International Airport. Mr. Wong, you'll be presenting. Let me just find your microphone for you. Would you mind hitting the button on the bottom? That should put yours on. Hang on a second. It is not coming up on my screen. Give me a second to find your microphone. Oh, there you go. First guess, I got it. Thank you. I'm live. Okay. Good evening, Your Worship, a member of councils and member of the public. My name is Johannes Wong, and I'm the manager of Long Range Planning. And I'm with my colleague, Mr. Ryan Olofsky, Manager of Facilities and Uti Utility Operations, uh, to present you the report on the expansion of transit services between Millwoods Town Center and Edmonton International Airport. This route is one of the five options, and indeed it is option three, in the administration report presented to Council on November 28, uh, 2023. Uh, administration work with uh, the deal transit after that on the cost information for this proposed service in, and in the process uh, we face some complication on scheduling issues and the number of buses that is required to operate this expanded route. At the end, uh, the report presented you with four scenarios uh, with different service levels uh, to accommodate this service route. Table 1 of the report presents cost information of the current transit service as well as the four scenarios, including one modified uh, scenario, scenario 4, which is a reduced version of scenario number 3. I want to present Council with administration's preferred scenario uh, moving forward and going back to uh, discuss the reasoning why administration make this recommendation. The Preferred scenario to Council is, should Council wish to expand transit service to include Edmonton International Airport as a destination, administration recommends proceeding with scenario number four on table number one. Scenario four proposes to use uh, two buses to operate the entire Millwoods to EIA uh, this route with a frequency of 15 minutes during weekdays peak hours, both in the morning and in the afternoon peak. The Beaumont to Millwoods route will utilize one bus and to retain the current 40 minutes frequency during weekdays off peak hours. It should note that this scenario only provides weekday service. It is the opinion of the administration that while delivering the highest level of service is ideal, starting with a lower service level is, is desirable, which enables administration for monitoring demand on a new transit route, as well as allowing for gradual increase and or adjust in service level as necessary in the future. This recommended scenario eliminates weekend service to maximize the tax impact to the community 
while maximizing benefits for the highest number of potential riders at a cost similar to the current levels. The current weekend riders only consist of approximately 8% of the total riders since the expanded service started in April of 2024. Indeed, in September 2024, of the 3,725 uh, 30, riders, only 315 were on the weekend service, which is only 8.45% of the total ridership in September. And you should also note that there will be opportunities for uh, further cost savings, as well as revenue sharing with future working with the dual transit. And to conclude with my uh, presentation tonight, uh, I would like Council to accept this uh, as the uh, report for information and also encourage uh, Councils to uh, consider this expansion service uh, at the upcoming budget discussion. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Appreciate that. At this point, um, let's see here. I've got my different mics on here. Uh, okay, so appreciate that. Um, I'll begin the conversation with uh, uh, my thoughts in the report. First of all, I do appreciate all the options. Uh, my concern is I understand the intent of the report is to give an idea to streamline budget processes to which they're kind of favoring. Uh, however, I'm not sure what the budget is going to be yet from administration. If it's plus 2% proposed budget, some options become attractive. If it's plus 6 or 8 or 10% budget, all of a sudden the scenarios come a little different. So in my viewpoint, I would prefer to have all the options included at budget time, not picking one this evening. So I have a motion prepared to that adjustment, but I want to start with questions first from members of council on the report itself. Then I'll put forth the motion to suggest that all budgets, all I scenarios be brought back to us at budget in the context of the proposed budget from administration to give us an idea of what these would actually cost uh, versus the actual budget increase. So with that, I'll open up to uh, questions from council. At this point, Councillor Penrod, you have the floor for questions. Thank you, Mayor Daniluk. Um, what you suggested sounds reasonable to me, um, so I would be inclined to support that. But I would just want to ask administration if there um, was a reason that they were looking for uh, to funnel it down a little bit at this meeting. Is there more research to be done to bring tighter numbers to the budget process, or what was your thinking there? Mr. Wong? Uh, our thought is uh, we presented the uh, different scenarios of this option with various uh, surface level and some of the surface level in order to um, bring it to like 30 minutes peak hours, then it will require not only users all our uh, existing buses, but also have to lease uh, two more buses, the worst case scenario. So, um, and that is why the cost is a little bit more. And the, with among the four scenarios, uh, and comparing with the uh, current surface level, and that is why administration in the report is recommending uh, considering scenario four. But I understand from the uh, from uh, mayor's uh, mayor's Dan uh, introduction remark. Uh, yes, we I think uh, this is a reasonable approach to consider all four scenarios in the in the discussion. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I do have a further clarifying question. All of these projections based on new levels of service starting July 1st. Um, can you give us some rationale or reasoning behind the July 1st date? Be uh, first of all, because we, we are not operating that, we have to uh, work with the dual transit and that will require some uh, leeway on negotiating the agreement, arranging uh, surface and when, when we talk to uh, the dual transit, the earliest possible time would be you know, uh, July. Yeah, that to bring everything in place. Um, I just wonder if there would be, if, if was it part of the discussion to uh, kick off the new level of service in September as we see, as people go back to work and go back to school, um, we tend to see ridership really spike up. I could imagine that there would be, that it would be preferable to have some lead time into that busier time of service to work out any kinks in the system. Um, so maybe uh, an August date. I just wondered why the July. Oh, date. just mid-year. Yeah. That partnership. And final question, if I might, Mayor. Please. Um, are there current conversations with Ladue County, um, all of these scenarios pushing out service towards EIA include service um, 
through Royal Oaks and, and parts of Ladue County, um, it would stand to reason that they would contribute to something to this service. Are, are those conversations ongoing? Yeah, there is. Uh, as mentioned in the council report, you're, you're mentioning probably alluding to the uh, possibilities of uh, revenue sharing, those things. Yet yeah, we, we, we talk about that, and there are uh, several options that we can do. And in the report, we presented one option, but that is not the definitive uh, uh, way to move forward. But the uh, due transit is open for uh, negotiation and discussion yeah, in okay. that regards. So order of operations is decide what we're willing to offer and then we can because, the T's and or yeah. the I's and cross the T's on yeah, it. Yeah, because this is only a preliminary discussions and uh, we, we do have to go up the, the level for during the negotiations too, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Barnard followed by Councillor Natalibus. Kathy, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, Councillor Penrod did ask one of the questions that I had. It was about Leduc County. So I look forward to seeing how that uh, plays out when the budget is, is presented. Um, my second question, though, was let's see if I've got this right. Under scenario four, where it says the tax levy is 39.9 more versus current service, does that mean it's 39.9 on top of? The, the new cost in the current service, which is related to expanding it for a whole year, 116000 The 399 is for half a year, um, for 2025 whole year, but the, in our, in our uh, scenarios, half of, of a year is the current service. So from January to June will be the current service that are running. And then in July, it will be the new service to EIA. And that is, uh, that is the differential uh, trying to come up with the total numbers on comparing scenarios one, two, and three. Scenario one, two, and three, yeah. Uh, so basically, for scenario one, if we are doing that in 2025 with uh, the first half of the year offering current surface, basically like weekdays, uh, 40 minutes, uh, and weekend surface, and then July to December would be, would be this new surface in scenario one. The, for example, the total cost will be, um, let me see, um, 1 mil, uh, 1 million, 1 1.17 million, right? And there is a differential of uh, over 1 million on top of the uh, whatever the uh, 2025 budget. So, and that is if the, we, we will need 455,000 more to operate scenario one. And that is what we are, we are in that table number one. Illustrate. I guess what's throwing me off, thank you, Mr. Wong, and, and I'm sorry to belabor this, but where you have under current service 116, 300, I'm assuming that's more yep. in, in 2024 because we've made some changes yep. to it. Yep. Yep. So does that mean that the current service in each one of the scenarios is that number, whatever that is, plus? the 455 or the 312 or the 143 or the 39, or is it a different number because the service in that scenario is different? Okay, let, okay, you, you're referring to table Actually, number. Actually, Ms. O'Neill wants to jump in on this point. Ms. O'Neill. Help. Thank you, through the mayor to Councillor Barnhart. I, I believe what you're asking is if there is no change to service, so our current service stays the same, next year the tax levy would be approximately 116,000 more than this year to account for that January to March period. If council wishes to adopt scenario one, two, or three, then next year would be 116,300 plus the cost of whichever scenario. So if that would be scenario four, for example, you would have 116,300 plus 39,900. Thank you. That, that's what I thought it said, but I wasn't 100% sure. So thank you for thank clarifying you. that. Thank you, councilor. Appreciate that. Councilman Talibus. You have the floor now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wong, for the presentation. Uh, thank you, Councillor Barnhart, for that question. I had the exact same one. So glad we got that clarified. And then uh, just, Mr. Wong, to your comment there, and we can see the dates here, but you're looking at, at basically six months um, of service at this rate. So going forward, we're basically doubling that in the following years. In 2026. Okay. Um, perfect. So thanks for clarifying that. Um, 
I guess one of the things come budget time, if we could uh, potentially consider it, and I don't know if it's been factored in here yet, but we did offer a significant discount on um, the toll to, to, to uh, access transit. Um, is there any increase in terms of the rates that we've captured in here, or is this at the 450? We are anticipating, uh, because the dual transit is currently um, charging uh, $5 per, per fare, and we, we will uh, match the $5 in order for the riders to basically cre be seamless when they get on the bus. It will be the same with uh, getting on our bus and getting on the, the dual transit bus. So it will be five bucks that we are presenting to uh, the council comes at the uh, fees and charges you know, discussion. Ms. O'Neill, do you want to add on to that? So your mic is on? Your mic Thank is on you now. Through the Mayor to Councillor Nantel and Boss, yes, the numbers that are in this chart reflect the $5 fare. That way it's consistent with Leduc Transit. Okay, so just to confirm a 50 cent increase. It's been built into these projections here. Of course, Council can de decide during budget, during fees and charges, if they want to keep the $5 or leave it at 450 then there would be another increase uh, on the tax levy. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Appreciate that. Seeing no further questions, members of Council, my questions were answered more or less by the questions of my previous Councillors. So with that, uh, Madam Clerk, could you put the motion on the screen that I mentioned alluding to earlier? Thank you. I'll move that the International Airport item be referred to the 2025 budget deliberations. Proceed by motion briefly. This motion simply takes all these scenarios tonight, brings it back to us at budget as part of the budget process. We can ascertain the actual cost based on the impact the budget has on it and make a better informed decision on any scenarios or keep things as they are. That's the intent of the motion to bring it back at budget. Any further discussion on the motion? Councillor Barnhart. We have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. And if this isn't appropriate time to ask, uh, let me know. But I had thought we were going to see the draft budget at the end of October. Is that is that changed now to November? Uh, November fifth, I think, is the budget date night? that we're going to be seeing that. Just just because I have scheduled time. Miss Morrison, you're on. Uh, yes, Mayor Councillor Barnhart. Um, the plan now is to bring the budget on November twelfth. That was actually an original plan. Um, then the November 5th special meeting was called and uh, not for budget purposes. And we thought if we could make it, absolutely. Um, but I believe we'll be bringing it November 12th now. Okay. I think I, I'm going to need to see all those dates again for questions and everything yeah, else. I'll right work now. on that with That'd you. Great. No you. problem. And council in general too. Not a problem. Thank you, Ms. Morrison. Any further questions on the motion? Seeing none, would you please initiate the vote? I have no further comments on the motion. Thank you, Council. That carries unanimously. Six nil in favor of the motion. Thank you very much. Uh, next item on our agenda is are there any Council inquiries this evening? I'm not aware of any, but some may have come up uh, since last year or so. Seeing none. Thank you. Oh, Councilor Natalibus, you have the floor. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Inquiry. I'm hoping administration uh, could please provide information on the following. Uh, please provide a rough estimate as to how much water would be conserved, as well as the operating cost savings that would be associated with a closed circuit system for our spray park. Additionally, please confirm if a closed circuit spray park uh, would be able to remain open when there's a restriction on water use. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any further Councillor inquiries this evening? Item R. Works. Let me get your microphone going for you here. Hang on, is that the right one? Uh, hang on. All right, All right, third time's a charm. Your mic's on, Mike. All right, we got it, and it's up on the screen. <clears throat> so from community services, the pool opened uh, today, or yesterday, actually. There was people in it today. Um, after The FCSS team is attending a FCSS provincial conference in November. Uh, we were chosen to uh, share at the program sharing market session. Uh, they were selected to showcase a recent project um, <clears throat> or in ways of providing services in our community. Our team will present on the seven sacred teachings. 
Economic development, small, this is Small Business Week. Uh, administration is encouraging everyone to go out and support their favorite local small business through a series of social media posts describing the importance of small businesses to our community, very important to our community, and we have lots of them. Infrastructure, work on crosswalk, um, <coughs> lights, upgrades at 10 locations will commence November 1st. They're projected to be installed and commissioned before 20, end of 2024. Uh, the signal work on 32nd Avenue and 50th Street is scheduled to be installed and function by late 2024. So the electrical is taking longer than anticipated, um, which sometimes those things do. Uh, but the uh, so the current lights will not be removed until a crosswalk signal is operational. A uh, nice picture of one of the basketball, what do they call those? Three point, there's a name, isn't there? Okay, far so, far so. <laughs> anyway, there's a picture of one of them. Uh, they look really sharp. Uh, the contractor did an excellent job. From planning and development, the uh, city continues to see strong building and development demand, another increase of 25% for residential permit approvals uh, in Q3 uh, over this time last year, and last year was crazy as well. Uh, total, total permits are up almost 30% uh, over this time last year, um, another record year. Neighborhoods are becoming more complete with services being provided in close proximity to where residents live, work, and play as larger complex development projects are being approved in new developing areas. Uh, city, city recently approved a mixed-use development called Danzero Landing, and you can see the address there. Uh, the approval allows for, for a permitted use consisting of 54 residential dwelling units and three commercial ground floor units, uh, one of which is designated for a future daycare. So our city continues to grow, and of course, we had that very positive announcement last week. Uh, uh, with the uh, joint school site in the uh, Azure, Allure, Azure area. And that's my update. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Schwartz. Appreciate that. Any questions for our CEO on his update? See none at this point. Thank you very much. The next item on our agenda is item 11 for members of council. I'm not aware of any. Seeing none, we'll move on to our next item on our agenda. Uh, which is closed session. So I ask our Madam Clerk to please put the closed session motion on the council. Move into closed session at 8.03 p.m. pursuant to the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act sections 21 and 25. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, members of council, would you please vote to move in camera? Would you please initiate the voting process? And that carries unanimously. Six nil to move into closed session. We'll wait until we make sure that our live feed is curtailed. Thank you. We are live back after our closed session. We had no business. Our motion is coming out of the closed session. And night. Oh, I've got the MRB event I've got to be at. Is anybody going? I am. You're going to 